The measure of a person is not what she consumes, but what she contributes. The measure of the person is not driving a Lexus and not a Hyundai, but what she contributes in her life to other people and to the communities that she's in, her business community or work community or spiritual community and her family. But this is a talk about business to business people. And here's the challenge for 21st century business. Can we create workplaces where people flourish? And I'd like to throw down the gauntlet and hope that businesses can rise to that challenge. Can we have people doing meaningful work? Can we have people who are fully engaged and not using 10% of their faculties? Can we create workplaces that foster relationships and communities? Are we giving people opportunities to achieve great things with their lives? And then finally, are people happy? And so this to me is a noble purpose for business, human flourishing. Yes, we need to turn on the lights. Businesses need to make money. They need to make money to pay people and keep things flowing. But money is the means and not the end. Welcome to Think Bigger, Think Better, where we explore how you can apply insights from visionary leaders and the most provocative philosophers and scientists of our time to make your life and our world a better place. Here's your host, author and speaker, Paul Gibbons. And hey, welcome back to Think Bigger, Think Better. Today's show is an excerpt from a talk I've given at corporations, once in Microsoft's Distinguished Author Program, once at Google, and once at Comcast. Corporate speaking engagements are one of the things I do for fun. Well, okay, I do them for money too. This talk starts with a big question, what matters in life or what is the meaning of life? Is it being happy as some, including the Dalai Lama, many contemporary self-help authors, lots of psychologists might suggest? No, with the greatest respect to His Holiness the Dalai Lama, there is much more to it. And the big idea is called human flourishing. We then turn to business. What can businesses do to engender human flourishing? Is business, as some say, just a money engine? Or in the 21st century, is that too narrow a way to think of it? And how can business engender human flourishing? We then look at 21st century business. Okay, human flourishing is the pretty important purpose, but what else? And there are three other dimensions to this idea of a purpose-led 21st century business. And then finally, I wrap up with a short piece on business and philosophy. Many of the ideas in this talk come from philosophy, from the Greeks to Kant to John Stuart Mill to contemporary ethicists such as McIntyre. And the big question is, is what can philosophy contribute to our conversations about business? But before launching into that, let me do two quick things. First of all, I want to give you a mini directory. If this is the first time you're listening to Think Bigger, Think Better, it has two things I think it make it singular among the many great podcasts out there. One is the eclecticism, and two is the equality of guests. So we have best-selling authors, CEOs, leading public intellectuals, and we talk about psychology, economics, polyscience, history, neuroscience, evolutionary biology, mental health. Two weeks ago, we covered depression. And last week's episode was on space travel, asteroids, Mars colonization, and all that. I really do shoot for only the best in the world, CEOs, best-selling authors, and leading public intellectuals. Coming up, I have a cabinet minister from New Zealand and the president of an ed tech company. Browse the content on my website, paulgibbons.net. Pick out the shows that catch your eye and hit that subscribe button or that like button if you enjoyed the show. On the subscribe button, there's one at the bottom of the show notes on my website. And in the show notes on my uh, website, you'll also find many, many useful links and a description of what's in the show, as well as some images. Or sign up for my regular newsletter that comes out when I release a book or a video. It's approximately weekly. You can support the podcast a number of ways. One is joining our Facebook page, Think Bigger, Think Better, where discussions we have discussions about some of the topics. The second is to write a review. Look, this helps a lot in rankings, and it takes about 10 seconds on iTunes to write a review. You click a button, uh, you put in a couple of kind words, and it really helps the quality stuff rise to the top. So if you could help with that, if you like the show, I'd really appreciate a review. And even more, if you write a review, I sent you a free book from one of our authors to send me an email saying I wrote a review and off I'll pop with the book. Or you could contribute a buck or two on Patreon. You know, many people make a living from their podcasts. 
on Patreon. We have a site there. We post episodes on Patreon. Again, you can do it for as little as a buck an episode. So if you love the show, that's a great way to share the love. So thanks for listening to all that. Many, many thanks. Thanks for listening. Thanks for your support. And let's get on with today's show. Okay, so let's start with the meaning of life. In college dorm rooms, we've been up too late. We've had a few too many of this, or, you know, back in the day, maybe we smoked too much of that. And we'd ask this question of each one another, what's the meaning of life? But when you grow up, usually today, it's treated somewhat cynically as a joke. We don't have time to think about the meaning of life here. We've got more pressing concerns. We don't have time for abstract concerns like that. We've got to check Facebook, or we've got to get to Walmart. But people philosophers, theologians have been thinking about the meaning of life since we stopped swinging from trees. Some of our current politicians, that was maybe quite recently, but for most of us, well, that was 50 or 100,000 years ago. Significantly, the Greek philosophers started batting that back and forth 2,500 years ago. So was the meaning of life to be good or to be virtuous? Those are platonic ideas, and some platonic virtues are courage, prudence, service, reason, and friendship. So that was a platonic meaning of life. A stoical meaning of life was being moderate and restrained, controlling your impulses. Or skepticism was another school of thought on the meaning of life, which meant withholding judgment, not acting without evidence, not being unreasonable in the sense of not having reasons for what you believe and what you do. Another approach to the meaning of life was the cultivation of intellectual and artistic pursuits, and that would be principally a Socratic notion. Was it pleasure? That's an Epicurean notion. But the one we settled on, the one that gets most play today, is the meaning of life is to maximize happiness. And that was perhaps pioneered mostly by Aristotle. So all of these themes have handed us down to the ages, and they found their way into religion and psychology and the self-help books for today. And you can see evidence for them today, even though the origins of this thought are 2,500 years ago. We've landed on happiness, but I want to introduce the question of whether happiness is a valuable or a way to define a human life. And I'm going to ask us to do a thought experiment today and ask us who we admire. Who of the people that I'm about to talk about would you say are living a good life? So say you watch the best footballer play or the best chess player or the best actor do their stuff. It's inspiring. Why? Because one of the things that we value in human experience is the idea of excellence. Let's take another question. Does caring for a sick friend make you happy? No, but yet we admire people who demonstrate that quality of care, Mother Teresa or the mother with the sick child. So care would seem to be another dimension of the meaning of life and not necessarily related to how happy you are. Are communities of people who are striving for a better world happy? Well, no, we admire them because they're committed to service and making a difference. Is a soldier doing their duty happy? Well, no, we don't think of that as the most important thing. We think of duty, we think of honor, and we think of service. We admire people who live lives of integrity and honor. We don't ask ourselves, but are they happy? Because integrity and honor honor are admirable themes in their own life. And we also admire people who achieve. And we don't ask ourselves necessarily whether someone like Steve Jobs or Elon Musk or Bill Gates was happy. Perhaps they were, perhaps they weren't. But what we admire about them is their achievements. And so there seems to be more, much, much more to the meaning of life than being happy. So then why so many self-help books on happiness? Why, if you go to the self-help and the psychology section of your bookstore, do you see so much on happiness and so little on these other ideas? Excellence, care, making a difference, service, duty, honor, integrity, and achievement. Well, I've got good news. There's a better concept than happiness. And this too is handed down to us from the Greeks. 
And the main notion is, is that the good life is much, much more than happiness. It's called eudaimonia, Y-O-U-D-A-Y-M-O-A-N-E-A. The best current translation of this Greek word is human flourishing. And I'm going to suggest that human flourishing is very close to the way that we want to think about the meaning of life. So what does it include? Well, today, positive psychologists have studied the meaning of life and human flourishing fairly extensively, and they've come up with a five-element framework for human flourishing. So see if these resonate with you. The first dimension, spiritual fulfillment, the meaning that you get from your life, some higher purpose, dedication to something bigger than yourself, doing things that matter. Dimension one. Dimension two, engagement with your life and work. How much of yourself is absorbed by what you're doing? This is related to being in a state of flow, being completely absorbed by a chast that's so challenging. Relationships. The greatest predictor of well-being is serving others and being supported by others. The fourth dimension is a sense of achievement. We like to get things done. We like to win. We like to build things that are huge and inspiring cathedrals and spaceships and computers. And then finally, the fifth dimension is what psychologists call positive affect, which we can call bluntly happiness. And so those five dimensions, spiritual fulfillment, engagement with task, having relationships and communities, a sense of achievement, and finally, feeling good, that's a current working definition of eudaimonia or human flourishing. So now that we've defined human flourishing, we want to look at the role of business and human flourishing. So let's take the first example, spiritual fulfillment. There's a Buddhist notion called doing right work. And I want to ask you this question. Does marketing the 200th kind of toothpaste or making cigarettes or guns fulfill people? Is that the sort of thing where someone can feel pride in their chest when they return home at night? I think that most people have jobs that are too small for their spirits. There's a second dimension to this spiritual aspect of work, which is meaning making, which is principally an inside job. It means getting your head right, creating the meaning. You know, once upon a time, I was pitching for a leadership development program to some multi-zillionaire investment bankers. And I was like, my internal dialogue was like, do I really want to help these guys make more dough? Is that really going to support me in life, inspire me in life? I had to transform my thinking to think, well, these people are human beings, and they have families, and they things things they want to contribute in life. And this is my chance to help them express themselves more fully. So I needed to change my narrative so that my work was more meaningful. And so you see the two dimensions there of meaningful work. One is this Buddhist notion of right work. And the second thing is getting your head right so that the work that you do do is fulfillment. And the Buddhist notion, again, is chop wood, carry water. Or deriving pleasure from the simple things of life, like doing the dishes or cooking a meal from your family, finding meaning in that. Let's take the second dimension of human flourishing, engagement. Remember the words of John F. Kennedy. We choose to go to the moon in this decade, not because it's easy, but because it's hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. And there you have it. If you're in a trivial, mindless task because it's only using 10% of your faculties and your ability to contribute, your life will be smaller than it could be and your work will be less fulfilling. Let's think about relationships. It's about love, baby. It's all about love. Nothing predicts longevity and well-meaning more than having nurturing relationships in your life, giving and receiving. Okay. Let's call it love. And so do workplaces today create the kind of environment, the kind of culture, and the kind of structure where people can truly be there for one another and not caught up in the petty political infighting that you see in many, many workplaces? Achievement. Computers, cathedrals, corporations, going to the moon, summiting Everest, conquering the atom, understanding the genome, 
producing Celebrity Apprentice. Okay, maybe not that. Human beings are capable of great, great things when we work together. Living that potential, realizing that potential, well, that's what makes us human. And that was the fourth dimension of how business can contribute to eudaimonia or human flourishing. And then the, finally, the fifth dimension I talked about was positive affect or happiness. But we've done something really strange in our culture. We've collapsed consumption and happiness. And so in some minds and some, if you look at our cultural images, they're almost one and the same. And you'd think they were. You'd think that having the $30,000 watch or the $75,000 car was equated with happiness. And, you know, it's a seductive trap. But the measure of a person is not what she consumes, but what she contributes. The measure of the person is not driving a Lexus and not a Hyundai, but what she contributes in her life to other people and to the communities that she's in, her business community, her work community, her spiritual community, and her family. But this is a talk about business to business people, and here's the challenge for 21st century business. Can we create workplaces where people flourish? And I'd like to throw down the gauntlet and hope that businesses can rise to that challenge. Can we have people doing meaningful work? Can we have people who are fully engaged and not using 10% of their faculties? Can we create workplaces that foster relationships and communities? Are we giving people opportunities to achieve great things with their lives? And then finally, are people happy? And so this to me is a noble purpose for business, human flourishing. Yes, we need to turn on the lights. Businesses need to make money. They need to make money to pay people and keep things flowing. But money is the means and not the end. Let me say that again. Money is the means and not the end. So I'd say the first and most important role for business is to engender human flourishing, and money is a means by which, a lubricant, if you will, by which you can do that. When we go to work, we give away a lot of our autonomy and authority. When we work for someone else in return, I think that we deserve much more than a paycheck. These are our lives, and most of us will work 100,000 hours in our lifetime. If we ain't flourishing, that sucks. If we're not doing meaningful work, if we're not engaged, if we're not in communities that foster relationships, if we don't have opportunities to achieve, and if we're not happy, our work sucks. And that, to me, explains a lot of, if you read some of the data on engagement data, the shitty engagement numbers that you see making the rounds something like 23% of people are fully engaged in their jobs. This goes a long way, I think, to explain it. And one of the things that we need to talk about, of course, is that human beings are treated as resources. We even have a word for it called human resources. One of the philosophers Kant's great contribution to morality was never treat a human being as a means to an end. Treat human beings as ends in themselves. And the sole idea of businesses there to make money, treating people as the means, is completely backward. Human beings, human flourishing, should be the ends and money the means rather than the other way around. And that's a transformation in mindset. And I think that's one of the things that capitalism needs to achieve in the 21st century. So how can business do that? Challenging idea. I would like to see a future where businesses devote more energy to doing things that matter, to creating things that value. There are 7.5 billion people on the planet as of last week, and many of them don't eat. Yet we've created a system where thousands of people might devote themselves to the launch of a new toothpaste. In a sense, we've created a system where doing work that makes money is more valuable than work that makes a difference. Look how much these professions make. Teaching, discovering new knowledge supporting the people who are the most challenged, perhaps through social work or perhaps through the pastoral professions, making stuff that people need, houses, food. Well, even that's not very well. Right? Farmers and, and house builders don't do as well as investment bankers and lawyers and marketing professionals. Let's think about this. Let's do a thought experiment. If you had a very brilliant friend, very talented friend, who devoted their life to a trivial and meaningless purpose, you think that was a shame. They could do more. And there's something for me about businesses in that same light. Is it capable of such great things? And there's nothing worse than seeing businesses squander their energy, squandering their productive capability, 
squandering their human talent on trivial things, on things that don't matter. I think currently our civilization squanders too much of its brilliance and talent on things that don't really matter when we could use that brilliance to solve our most important problems and to achieve things that really matter. So in my view, with all the creativity and ingenuity that humans are capable of, we ought to be able to create economic structures where basic needs are met as something a travesty, that with all the wealth and technology at our disposal, we haven't yet solved the problems, the very fundamental problems of human existence for many, many people on the planet. So in short, again, I think business needs to focus on things that matter over things that make money and to, in a sense, put the horse back in front of the cart. The second function, I think, for business in the 21st century is as applied knowledge. And that sounds very abstract, but what do I mean by that? The purpose is to scale human invention so it makes a bigger difference. Corporations with 50,000, 100,000, 200,000 people, even half a million people, have the capability of scaling and delivering value to many more people than a small startup of a dozen people. Business scales knowledge and makes it available to humankind. Because without business, scientific knowledge or engineering knowledge, all the stuff that I love would remain on lab benches and in obscure journals. And so this sacred and noble purpose for 21st century business is to scale knowledge, to scale science, to help engender human flourishing. So IBM turning artificial intelligence to solving poverty, hunger, and illiteracy, or Tesla with its broad efforts towards sustainability and perhaps a sustainable earth and perhaps even beyond the earth. So the measure of a business, I think, is the size of problems it's prepared to try and solve, which is one of the reasons why I'm such a big Elon Musk fan. A third thing, a third purpose for business in the 21st century is creating places where people collaborate, communities. We are going to work, as I said, 100,000 hours in our lifetime. It's we squander our life if we work in toxic environments. Human beings can't really do anything complex or interesting by ourselves, not anymore. You know, the ideas of da Vinci's or the great man theory of leadership or the solo inventor, well, those were never really true today. And today, the work that we really admire is done by big groups of people collaborating globally, scientific achievements, engineering achievements, and business achievements. I mean, even something like, oh, for example, a Falcon rocket or something like that. We associate that with Elon Musk, who's certainly a leader that I admire a great deal. But we do a disservice to the tens of thousands of people who helped Elon Musk along the way. He's in fact a symbol or a figurehead of this great achievement and, you know, part an architect and a leader of it. But the great things that we admire, Notre Dame, the invention of the computer, the International Space Station, or the invention of the internet, weren't single person inventions. So businesses are places where human beings come together to flourish together as human beings and to do things that matter together and to use science and knowledge for the betterment of us all. And why is that worth mentioning? Because by and large, we're infected with dysfunctional notions of what business enterprise ought to be about. Business, a potentially noble institution corrupted by silly ideologies that put the means before the ends. So to close, I'm going to talk a little bit about the role of philosophy in business as one of my hot topics. Philosophers take a lot of heat, you know, and a lot of it's justified abstract logic, hair splitting, questions such as, are we living in the matrix or how do we know what this is the real world? One famous philosopher, G.E. Moore, said beginning of the 20th century, when someone asked him a question about how we know there's a real world, he said, well, he's English, he wouldn't have said it this way, but I'll say it this way. He said, look, buddy, here's one of my hands and here's the other, QED. Is proved there's a real world. And so that Moorian example of is an example that perhaps more abstract philosophy, why philosophy is no longer so interesting as a subject for many people. But we've already seen that philosophers from 2,500 years ago anticipated positive psychology. This notion of human flourishing, I think, is one that's very valuable and that we could adopt in our lives and in our businesses. And they anticipated the growth mindset. It's another 
hot topic in business psychology today. Those aren't isolated things. And by and large, philosophers have been thinking deeply about the human condition for much, much longer than the psychologists of the 21st century and in much more rigorous ways. One of the other things that philosophy does that's really useful to business is it helps us understand how we know what is true, what is provable, and what the evidence says. Business leaders, by and large, make decisions based on experience. That's why we hire people that are older often rather than people that are younger because they have, quote unquote, more experience. But if you look at cognitive psychology, that's like one of the worst things you can do. We have amazing news from evolutionary biology. Human beings are amazing at filling in patterns. You can recognize an image of a face on a computer screen with 95% of the pixels removed. The problem is, is that great pattern matching apparatus recognizes patterns where there ain't none at all, which is why experience is only one of the things that you can want to consider when you're making a decision in a business. What do I mean? It's trivially true that no two situations are alike. But when something happens, we want to take a template from our previous experience and apply that to what we're working on at the moment. When I do this, this is what happens. If I do this, this will happen. If I pull this lever, it'll produce this result. You want to do that in situation after situation after situation. But complex systems are unique, and you can't always tell cause and effect so easily. Correlation isn't cause, but our egos lead us to confirmation bias, and we don't really see or use evidence very clearly. So if you get to the end of a book that I wrote called The Science of Organizational Change, there's chapters that include science-based leadership and evidence-based leadership. What are some of the questions? Well, if I pay people more, do they work harder? If I apply sanctions and punishments, do it work? How about praise and rewards? Are those functional? Are those helpful? If I hold a certain kind of workshop or I intervene in a certain way in a group, Will people change their behavior? If I give people skills training, say today diversity training, for example, will that improve performance? Is charisma important to leadership? Does coaching produce valuable results? These are things that science, business science will tell us. But we tend to rely in 21st century business still much too much on faith. We want to make decisions in business based on four features. The best science that we have available. Science tells us cause and effect. It tells us if I pull this lever, it's very likely that this will happen. Only science can do that in a reliable way. We want to rely on data, analytics. We want to rely on concerns of stakeholders. And lastly, we want to rely on our experience. But we want all four of those. Again, experience matters, but so does the science of cause and effect, So do data and analytics, and so do what stakeholders will think of our decision. So business decision-making, in a sense, is still, from my point of view, in in the Stone Age. In the change world, a world where I swam in for 20 years, what I dealt with most of the time is people who ignored stakeholders, ignored the data, and ignored the science, and then wandering around puzzled why they didn't produce the results that they want to produce. You know, it's said sometimes that 70% of change projects fail, 50% of change projects fail. There are numbers being thrown around. That's one of the principal reasons. Philosophy, business philosophy, also asks us the question, who should be in charge? What is the moral basis for the authority that someone has? Take your boss. How far does their authority extend over you? Do they have the right to ask you to work longer hours? What rights do people have when we go to work? Right now, the way workplaces are are structured, particularly in the United States, particularly with employment laws, you basically have one right at work, yeah, the right to leave. (laughs) And, you know, one of the things we do is we value democracy and freedom and autonomy in our political side, in our nation states or something like that. When you sign a contract to work for someone, you sign away a lot of your autonomy, a lot of your freedom, and a lot of your democratic rights because workplaces aren't democratically structured. So since the 1950s, people have dabbled in business democracy, organizational democracy, trying to tap into the self-organizing nature of some human systems. Some systems of people, like say kindergartners, descend into chaos or think about the Lord of the Flies. But some systems self-organize. Think about a murmuration of a flock of starlings or a bee colony. And so in self-organizing systems, 
with organizational democracy. We need to think about creating the conditions where self-organization is producing virtuous results rather than, say, kindergartners destroying the classroom or the Lord of the Flies creating dysfunctional communities. So how do we do that? And today we see experiments in things such as holacracy or things such as teal organization, which are interesting ways of thinking about self-organization and organizational purpose. My old company, a small consultancy, about 50 people, when it was at its biggest in London, was founded along these so-called teal principles. It was perhaps the first consulting firm that used those principles, and today they do most of the work today with companies such as Zappos and Shell and Microsoft. And finally, the fourth thing I think philosophy brings to business is philosophy is where ethics is explored in the greatest depth and with the most rigor. Corporations, in my view, don't get an ethical pass just because they're corporations. If you look at an individual and you said, are they a good person? The fact that they follow the law is not a sufficient answer. That's a hygiene factor. That's the very minimum we expect for someone to be a virtuous person in societies today. And the same is true with corporations. Just following the law is completely insufficient. The standard we need to adhere to for ethical behavior in corporations is that they do more than the law requires and less than it permits. Should corporations be treated as individuals? Should they have rights of free speech? Are there limits to that speech? Are there limits to how much speech they can purchase? Are there limits to how much corporations can influence public opinion? Here's an interesting thought problem for you. If there was a food stuff at the grocery store between the baked beans and the tomato soup that killed 500,000 people a year, 500,000 people a year, would it last very long? No. How many deaths before it was taken off the shelf? dozen, less than that, half a dozen. So if I said that there was something on the shelves of the, of the grocery store that killed 500,000 people a year, you might be shocked. And of course there is, it's tobacco. Tobacco in just this century, in just the 21st century, despite the advantages and restriction of its use, kills approximately 8 million people over the last 18 years of this century. It was much worse in earlier decades. So here's the thing. How did that happen? And from my point of view, there's a long story here, but it's the ability of corporations to use their so-called free speech rights, their rights to advocate, to form fake tanks, and to adversely sway the political process and also the citizenry with false information or what we now tend to call fake news. And I think we need to think about that because in today's information age, we need the sanctity of information, the excellence of our information in order to make decisions both for ourselves and our lives and in our businesses and as voters and citizens in our countries. And so information, I do not think, can be corrupted the way it is today by money. And so that's an interesting problem that we have to solve, but it's also a problem that business has to solve. And it's a problem that philosophers spend a lot of time thinking about. So I wanted to show in this final part of the talk that philosophy is an interesting adjunct to how we think about business. Uh, One of the things I do to help earn a living is I teach business ethics at the University of Denver as a professor, and I hope that this has given you some ideas on the sorts of things that I might cover in that course. Philosophy is about the questions, about being with the question and continuing to ask questions and seeking for answers even when questions get hard. So I hope you leave this at least more inclined to be business philosophers to think more deeply about the work you're doing. And so to recap, we started with the meaning of life and how some of the ideas, important ideas in the meaning in life that were developed 2,500 years ago were discarded in favor of this idea of happiness and how actually when we think about the good life, when we think about footballers, when we think about great artists, when we think about soldiers, when we think about parents caring for a sick child, we can quickly see that how we, our moral intuitions, think about the good life doesn't always have anything to do with happiness at all. It's only one dimension of it. We then looked at an idea called human flourishing, which is a very old idea from the Greeks called eudaimonia, which positive psychologists have picked up. And we looked at the five dimensions of human flourishing, we then looked at how business can create human flourishing and whether that's a noble purpose for business of creating work that matters, creating engaged communities. And then finally, finally, we talked more about other purposes for business in the 21st century, scaling science and technology for the benefit of humankind. 
And then finally, we finished with philosophy and business. So I hope you enjoyed this. It's something of a talk I, I often give, and it's a little excerpt from it. Usually, it's uh, much more lengthy. But thanks for listening very much. Thanks for listening to Think Bigger, Think Better. And I'll leave you with that. Thanks. And hey, this is the part of the show when I get to talk about fun stuff I love in contemporary culture, books I'm reading, music I'm listening to, TV shows I'm watching. The big news, from my point of view, is Jean-Luc Picard is coming back. He's going to reprise his role at the age of 82 as captain of the Enterprise. If you don't know, by the way, that I'm talking about Star Trek, I, I really don't know what to say to you. I have rediscovered Better Call Saul, the prequel, if you will, to Breaking Bad. The first season was sort of disappointing. It had the great acting performances that I was used to in Breaking Bad, but I, I just thought the show lacked plot and it lacked dramatic tension. So I, I dropped it, um, but someone you know insisted that it was uh, as good as Breaking Bad in many ways, and so I gave the second season a whirl, and wow! You remember all the creepy villains from Breaking Bad? Tuco and Hector Salamanca, the two assassins from Juarez, and, and wait for it, of course, Gustavo Fring, and Pollos Hermanos, well, they're all back in season two. And so with that and those marvelous, marvelous baddies, the show does bring into something that I thought was missing, which is dramatic tension and the good fights between good and evil. So if, like me, you decided you were done after season one, well, it's worth a second look. Uh, I did start The Handmaid's Tale, and I have to say, I can see why people say it's excellent, but it, the tension in that is almost too much. Like, it's almost too creepy. So I need to get back into The Handmaid's Tale and, and, and give it a try. It sincerely looks like it's excellent, but it's almost, you know, almost too frightening. And yes, the resonances with contemporary politics are, uh, are striking in my view. On the movie front, I've been really disappointed this summer. I see mostly movies with my kids, so I depend on people to make movies that are both good for kids and that aren't real snooze fests for adults, or worse. Uh, the current run of movies from the summer, The Meg, Alpha, Kin, Axel, Sky Trapper, they're pretty crap. And so I've had to sit through many hours of pretty crappy music movies over the last six weeks with my kiddos. So I hope that Hollywood produces something that adults uh, – can enjoy while they're sitting there with their teenagers and younger children there. I just saved you 50 bucks if you were going to run out and see those things. I did enjoy Denzel and Equalizer too, but then uh, who doesn't enjoy Denzel? Don't take your kids, by the way, to Equalizer too. I'm in one of those situations in my life when I've literally got so many books piled up on my nightstand, so many books piled up around the house. I literally, I'm almost on a book buying moratorium. I have about 10 on the go. They're all amazing. I've got Yuval Harari on the go. I've got Steven Pinker on the go. I've got a book on the microbiome on the go, a book on cognitive behavioral therapy on the go, a few philosophy books and some sci-fi books. So I'm really overwhelmed and swamped. But anyway, I would love your recommendations uh, on my Facebook page or perhaps, you know, drop a note on my website on, you know, any great books. I, I mostly read nonfiction, but uh, I also dip into some sci-fi and some outstanding contemporary fiction. So suggest a way. And don't forget to suggest guests for the show that you think would be uh, valuable additions to the show. I, I'm very good at reaching out and getting hold of people. So I'd really appreciate that. Please uh, click some of those subscribes and those likes and those reviews. And those really make a big difference to the show. And so I really appreciate your support in all those regards. And that's it. Thank you very much. Talk to you next week. To celebrate the launch of the show, and thank you all for listening, I'm going to be giving away books. Lots and lots of books. All you have to do is leave a review in iTunes. We're going to raffle off a book every single week for 12 weeks. So head on over to paulgibbons.net slash iTunes to get easy-to-follow directions and let me know the title of your review to make sure that you're entered to win. And thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of Think Bigger, Think Better. Great ideas are great, but this isn't gospel. Share your critical thinking in the comments. Where do I disagree? What insights were most powerful? If you got value, don't forget to share the value by sharing the podcast. Finally, to get information on book and blog releases and new video content, head over to paulgibbons.net and join the community of thinkers talking about using science and philosophy to make our world a better place. <laughs>